Hi, I'm Prof L and welcome to Chemistry Matters. Today we're going to be looking at the ideal gas equation. Now, if you've seen, I guess, any number of the videos on this channel, which are related to stoichiometry, you'll know that I often go on about the fact that you really only need to know two equations to do any stoichiometry problem. And you'll notice that I normally say that you can do 99% of stoichiometry problems using these two equations. Okay, big M is little m upon n, and C is equal to n over V. And these are related to stoichiometry because they both contain this factor here, n, the number of moles. Now there is a third equation. Now it's certainly not used as widely as these guys here, but it is important, so we're going to dedicate an episode to it. It is this thing here. This is the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. We're going to put it in a red box because it's worth knowing. So let's look at an example of the use of this equation uh, in terms of a stoichiometric problem. And so the problem that we are going to be solving in the first instance is what volume does one mole of an ideal gas occupy at a pressure of atmospheric pressure and a temperature of about room temperature, in other words, 25 degrees. So that should be hopefully a relatively straightforward problem to begin with. So we want to know the volume that one mole of gas occupies under these conditions, okay? So the first thing that we need to do <laughs> is we need to rearrange this equation. Now people think, gosh, this has got five components, it's going to be difficult to rearrange. Not really because we want to make volume the subject of this. All we need to do is divide both sides by pressure. And so therefore V is equal to nRT upon P. Uh, again, <laughs> I've seen that equation rearranged in many interesting ways, um, <laughs> all but one of them incorrect, I guess. Now, the really important point about the ideal gas equation is that you need to use strict SI units here. Now, the major difference is the volume. Okay, because when you're using strict SI units in this equation, you end up with a volume in, not liters, but in fact cubic meters. Because strictly speaking, the SI unit of volume is in fact the cubic meter. So that's very important to realize. The answer that we're going to get is something in cubic meters. So remember, let's come back to the question. We want the volume of one mole of gas. So N equals one, we'll call it 1.00 just for significant figures sake. R is the thing called the gas constant. That will always be given to you. It's a constant of nature. You don't have to remember this. It has a value of 8.314 joule per mole per Kelvin. And the temperature, we said 25 degrees, didn't we? 25 degrees Celsius, because that's roughly room temperature. Ha ha, but we have to use SI units. So we don't use degrees Celsius. We use the SI unit of temperature, and that is the Kelvin. And to, in order to get from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273, okay? So therefore, 25 degrees is gonna be 298 Kelvin. And we're gonna divide that by atmospheric pressure. And again, this will always be given to you. You don't have to remember this. Atmospheric pressure is 1.013 times 10 to the power of five Pascals. Pascal is the SI unit of pressure, okay? And so as I said, provided that you are using SI units here, and let's just put in a mole there just to make that really clear, then you're gonna end up with um, the volume in units of cubic meters. Okay, so we go ahead, we do our calculation here, and we end up with 0.0245 as the number, the unit of this, as I said, it's a unit of volume, the SI unit of volume is the cubic meter, and we end up with 0.0245 cubic meters. If you want that in liters, that then translates to 24.5 liters. Okay, 
So that's kind of interesting. That is what volume one mole of any gas, it doesn't matter what your gas is, this is any gas will occupy under these particular conditions of pressure and temperature. Remember this is called the ideal gas equation, so it only applies to gases that behave ideally, but we won't go into that today. We will leave that for your uh, physical chemistry classes, I guess. So, nice little example um, there. Now, let's go to an example that is a little bit more um, stoichiometric, okay? So, we have got a 0 0.1054 gram sample which contains a thing called potassium chlorate, KClO3, okay? Now again, this is uh, an impure sample, okay? So we know there is some potassium chlorate in this solid sample, we don't know how much. Here's the total mass of the sample. What we're going to do is we're going to do some analysis to try and figure out how much of this was in the actual sample, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to heat this, and when we heat it, it decomposes, and all of the oxygen in here, in your potassium chlorate, ends up as gaseous oxygen. So, from the amount of gaseous oxygen that we get out of this when we heat this stuff up, can we then figure out how much potassium chlorate we actually had in this impure sample? Hey, I wouldn't bother asking the question unless it had an answer. The answer is obviously yes, we can. So how do we go about doing this? Okay, well, what we need to know, how much oxygen did we get off? Well, the volume of oxygen was 22.96 milliliters, okay? And we obtained that at, at a pressure of 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals and at a temperature of, so P equals this, temperature is equal to 25.0 degrees Celsius. So there's all our data. We take our sample, we heat it to decompose this to oxygen, and these are the conditions under which we obtain the oxygen. There's your volume, there's a pressure, there's a temperature. And as part of this sort of question, you would also be told that R is equal to 8.314 joule per mole per Kelvin. And it's a very, very, very good bet that if you meet this in any exam question, that you're going to be, have to be using the ideal gas equation to solve the particular problem in question. Okay, so that's something to watch out for. Right, so what are we doing here? How do, how do we do all this? Well, we look at our data, don't we? We see from our data we're given R, V, P, and T. So what equation do we know that contains R, V, P, and T? Well, we just learned it. PV equals NRT. So what don't we know in this equation? We're given R, we're given P, we're given V, we're given T. We don't know what N is. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is calculating N, the number of moles of O2, isn't it? Because if we know the number of moles of O2, we know that that's going to be related to the number of moles of oxygen in potassium chlorate and basically the number of moles of potassium chlorate, which is what we're after. That's, that's the question that we need to answer. Okay, so let's rearrange this equation and make N the subject. So the number of moles, how do we rearrange this? We want to get rid of RT on this side. We want to pop it over here. Let's divide both sides by RT. So N is equal to PV upon RT. Right, pressure, 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals multiplied by the volume, now, aha, 22.96 mils, milliliters. As I said, whenever we're using this equation, we can't use liters or milliliters, we need to use cubic meters. So, how many milliliters are there in a cubic meter? The answer is a million. 
Okay, so you've got a factor of 10 to the 6 here. So 22.96 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters divided by R times T, 8.314 uh, joule per mole per Kelvin. Multiplied by the temperature, again, they will always give it to you in degrees Celsius. You have to remember to change it to Kelvin. That's 298. And then if you do that, the answer that you're going to get is equal to 9.39 times 10 to the minus 4 mole. Okay, so that's the number of moles of oxygen, O2. Now, how does that then relate to the number of moles of KClO3? Okay, um, well, might be a good idea here to convert uh, the number of moles of oxygen molecules to the number of moles of oxygen atoms. That might just make things a little bit clearer, okay? <clears throat> So, 9.39 by 10 to the minus 4 moles of O2, so then the number of moles of oxygen is going to be twice that number. 2 times 9.39 times 10 to the minus 4 mole, and that then equals 1.88 times 10 to the minus 4 3 mole of oxygen. Okay. Now, how does the number of moles of oxygen relate to the number of moles of potassium chlorate? There's another question you've got to get your head around. Okay. So in every mole of potassium chlorate, there are three moles of oxygen. So therefore, the number of moles of potassium chlorate is going to be equal to this number divided by 3. We have fewer moles of potassium chlorate than we do of oxygen. Okay, It's going to be 1.88 times 10 to the minus 3 mole over 3, and that is equal to 6.27 times 10 to the minus 4 mole of potassium chlorate. Okay, and there comes a time in <laughs> all stoichiometric calculations when you think, aha, I'm nearly there. And this is that time, because what we've done here is we've got an amount, a number of moles. We're one step away from getting a mass, okay? So once we've got an amount, we can always get a mass, provided that we know the molar mass, so therefore, uh, the mass is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass, which is 6.27 times 10 to the minus 4 mole, multiplied by molar mass, which is potassium, which is 39.1, plus chlorine, which is 35.45, and three oxygens, 3 times 16.00, grams per mole, and if you multiply all of that out together, you then get 7.68 times 10 to the minus 2 grams. Okay, and there's your answer. Okay, so we had a 0.1054 gram sample. We knew there was some potassium chlorate in it. We knew it was impure. We do all the calculations, and we did the calculation on the basis of the volume of oxygen that came off when we heated this. And we work back through, we used our mole ratios, and then we figure out that of that 0.1054 gram sample, 0.0768 grams of it originally was KClO3. Okay? So that, I think, is in fact a really, really nice example of how we can use the ideal gas equation in stoichiometric problems.
Okay, obviously it's going to be confined to any chemical reactions that involve gases. We've been through all of the important points. The really, really big important point on this one is uh, you've got to use SI units. Your volume's got to be in cubic meters, your temperature has got to be in Kelvin, and your pressure has got to be in Pascals. Provided you do that, everything comes out in the wash and you get an answer that is hopefully the correct one. So there you go, there's not only two equations that you need to worry about for stoichiometry, there's actually three, but the one that we've been looking at today is not used all that often. You still, of course, need to know how to use it, uh, and hopefully this has helped you in that respect. So we'll see you next time.